grace and peace this morning to each and every one of you, all of you, every one of you. Thank you for being here this morning. It is a grand day. It is a wonderful day. It is a day to celebrate to administration, to staff, to faculty. Congratulations to all of you. To families, I sat where you sat once. Congratulations to all of you. Graduates, I sat where you sat once. And so I say to you not only congratulations, but welcome to the ranks of Baker graduates. I've always said the world needs more of us, and now there are more as of today. Today is the day that is called graduation. It is a day of endings, but it is also called commencement, a day of beginnings. So today is a day to celebrate learning. Today is a day to celebrate those who have accomplished, and today most especially is a day for us to celebrate God's love and God's blessings. I now have the duty and the pleasure to introduce somebody who doesn't need any introduction around here. I always see her smiling, but she's smiling even more this morning. The President, Dr. Pat Long. for us here at Baker University. I want to thank the church and, and Reverend Mavcock for your partnership with us. We know that this disrupts your service a little bit on Sunday when we come here, and yet you've been so kind to us, and you've been kind to our students. You've been such a part of our partnership. And thank you so much to you and the members of your church who feed our students every Thursday. They've loved it. Those of you who have gone to uh, chapel every Thursday and had that wonderful food, thank you so much. Thank you for being wonderful partners. Well, students, here we are. And later today, I'm going to talk to you again, but I just have a few words this morning of support and encouragement. Each one of you has such wonderful opportunities in front of you, and I know you have big plans. Some of you already know who you're going to marry. Some of you have already been accepted into graduate school. Many of you already have jobs lined up. Some of you are going on mission trips. You just have those big plans ahead of you. And I was thinking this morning when I was sitting where you were many years ago, my plan was to be a high school math teacher and coach girls basketball. And I never did either one of them. Never did either one of those. So for some reason, God had a very different plan for my life. And it was far better than I could have ever imagined. My, one of my life passages that you've all heard, I told you this at last lecture, and I'll tell you again, is Jeremiah 29, 11 and 12. And it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope, and the future. And then verse 12 goes on to say, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. My prayer for you is sometimes when those plans that you have sitting here today don't go exactly as you had thought, just remember that God has a plan for you. And that if you will listen to him and if you will come to him and rely on him, that that plan is probably better than you ever hoped or dreamed. And in a few years, you may be standing up here and giving that same advice to someone else. So we wish you all the best. In just a few minutes, you're going to be blessed to hear Reverend Dr. Iris de Spain come and speak to us one more time. I have the honor of introducing him before uh, we hear the passage read and, and our choir sing. And he needs no introduction, but I think it's only right to remind us who we are hearing from today. I has been our minister for 22 years. He had his bachelor's, he uh, received his bachelor's degree from Baker. 
He went on to get his master's from St. Paul's School of Theology, and then his doctorate from Perkins School of Theology at SMU. He served as several pastors, uh, he served as the pastor of several churches, and then we were blessed that someone made the great decision of saying, come back to Baker. Here's God's plan. It was better than the church. It was our church pastor right here for thousands and thousands of students. Ira's been our spiritual advisor. He's been our leader in both good times and bad. Uh, he's given us the thought for today. I was going to tweet a thought for today, but I thought, no, I couldn't do that. Thought uh, for the week. He shared outstanding sermons on Thursday. He's encouraged our students. He's been in all the sporting events, the theater events, the music events. He's been so active in all of our lives. He's given you counsel when you needed it. He's been your guide whether you were in chapel or not. Everybody has known Ira. He's been our counselor, our connector, our conscience, and our caring friend. And I've said this before, but I think during the time here, he's been at 85 commencements. He's seen over 20,000 students graduate. And he's been the one that's given the first and last word at every one of those. In recognition of his work, Iris received several awards. I'll just give you a couple. In 2002, he won the Francis Asbury Award for the, from the General Board of Higher Education and Ministry of the United Methodist Church for fostering United Methodist Ministries in Higher Education. In 2012, you all, as the Greek fraternities, gave him the Advisor of the Year. But I think these are the most meaningful. Four times, Student Activities Council has said he's been the Community Member of the Year. Now we're going to hear from Ira in just a few minutes, and uh, I, I can't wait. He said he's been preparing for this speech for a long time. But first, we're going to be blessed with some music from our concert choir and a responsive reading from the Reverend Antonio Briones, who is the father of our graduating senior, Abby. And he's the pastor of Shekinah Disciples of Christ Church in Juarez, Mexico. And I want to thank the students in the choir for getting up this morning and being here. I know we had a few activities last night that might have been, you might have been out late for so that you are here and you're going to be in good form and thank Miss Kathy Crispino because it has been our joy and our blessing all year to hear from you students and I know it's going to be no different today. So now let's hear from our choir and have our worship service continue.
from Proverbs 2, 1 to 6. We're going to do the call to worship this morning. Wisdom called to us, my child, if you accept my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, if you seek wisdom like silver and search for it like hidden treasure, then you will understand faith in the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity, equity every good path. Let us praise the Lord from whom all the wisdom comes. Let us sing of God providence and power. guy <laughs> so I just 
try to do my best, but let me do this in Spanish, so this uh, service will be multicultural, <laughs> and uh, it's my honor, and I was so honored being invited by the President and Pastor Ira. Thank you so much. This is uh, my biggest honor. Thank you so much. Señor, te doy gracias en el nombre de Jesús por cada joven que esta mañana se presenta delante de ti. Son vidas hermosas, hombres y mujeres que marcarán el destino de esta comunidad y de este país y en muchos otros lugares. Ellos serán dignos representantes de la Universidad de Baker en una sociedad que necesita cambios. Gracias por cada uno de los maestros, por la presidenta, por los pastores, por aquellos hombres y mujeres que sirviéndote a ti, les sirven a ellos y les dan palabra, y les dan conocimiento, y les dan un espíritu fuerte con el cual puedan enfrentar los días por venir. En esta mañana invocamos tu nombre y suplicamos tu presencia, que tu Espíritu Santo se derrame sobre cada uno de ellos, sobre cada familia que esta mañana comparte la alegría y la satisfacción de ver un sueño concluido. Invocamos tu presencia y lo pedimos todo en el nombre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo. Amén. Please be seated and join me in our litany of thanksgiving. Give thanks to God, who alone is good. Let us praise God for the rich heritage we share as students, teachers, and friends of Baker University. For the sense of history that surrounds us here, 156 years of struggle and service. For the vision and courage of those who work to establish this university, believing that sound learning sets people free. For those whose names we recall often and those whose names we will never know. For the creative role we have been called to play in the continuing life and growth of Baker University. We praise and bless you, God. For teachers who encourage students to examine life from a new and wider perspective. We praise and bless you, God. For administrators, counselors, and staff whose concern and sensitivity enable students to move beyond the limitations that hinder growth. We praise and bless you, God. For the lasting friendships and supportive community that each generation finds here. We praise and bless you, God. For the freedom that encourages us to express our faith and examine religious beliefs in an open and accepting academic context. We praise and bless you, God. For the tradition of university and church working together to create an atmosphere in which learning is given a distinction of a dimension of depth. Receive our gratitude, God, for all those who have lived and worked in this university community. Enable us, like them, to take up the challenge of renewing our society and our world.
Can I get an amen from the congregation? Amen. It's a great thing about having a choir like this because it doesn't matter what you say or how you do it because they're going to carry the day. Thank you so much for being here. And this is not the sermon. This is the prayer time. So I'm wearing a couple hats today. Thank you so very much. There's three things that I want to tell you as we come to our time of prayer. The first is that I want to name it to this service and to this day. The name of Tyler Jack. Started with you. Did not finish with you. After his freshman year, as you know, died very tragically and suddenly in a swimming accident in Beaver Lake, Northwest Arkansas. He is here. He has been with you, walking with you all this time. And we remember him today. Second thing, this is the 44th anniversary of my graduation. Uh, the good thing is that you know, the four-year cycles that I, like you, am a member of King Arthur's Court. Can we get an amen for King Arthur's Court? <laughs> All of you, say it loud. Amen. King Arthur's Court. Amen. We're the party people. Did you know that? <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm pulling privilege today, uh, and I'm walking through the gate with you because that's my gate. So I'm just uh, going to do that with you later on today. The important thing about uh, saying all that is that uh, we're going to meet again one day, perhaps when you come back for your 40th uh, anniversary uh, reunion, and I'll be here for my 84th, you know, we're going to gather <laughs> out of the lodge, we're going to sit underneath that, that grizzly bear, that stuffed grizzly bear, and we're going to talk about the good old days. And I want you to know, and I'm going to tell you right now, that in 40 years, when you come back and we have that conversation, if you say to me that the college years were the best years of your life, I'm going to tell you that you have wasted your life. Because you know what? It gets better. I mean, it really does. And if, if you've not yet met your spouse, don't ever tell your spouse that your best years were before you met them. <laughs> okay? If you have children, if you have children, don't say the best years of your life was before they were born. So each, each age and stage of life has challenges, has joy, has difficulty, hardship, that's life. And all I want to do is encourage you to live your life, live your life each day and be prepared for whatever challenge there is for you that day. That's the second thing. The third thing is this, when you move, because, well, how do I start this? In, in 2008, my wife, Barb, who I think is in the balcony today, are you there? Well, there you are, hi. Well, we, uh, we decided that I would retire in 2014. So, I've been sitting on that for six years. That means that when you showed up in 2010, I paid special attention to you because I knew that this day would come and that we would be walking out together. And when we gathered by the arch, by your gate, and I did that traditions walk with you. You know the traditions walk when you're a freshman. You think is really silly. It doesn't make any sense until today, right? When we walked through that arch, and I walked you around the campus a little bit, uh, I knew that I would be walking through that arch with you. So uh, I said the other day, and it's, I don't mean to be creepy, I've been keeping my eye on you, not in a creepy way. <laughs> but uh, I've, been, I've been paying special attention to you because it was an honor to to be here with you. And during the Welcome Week activities, if you went to the Welcome Week Chapel, I promised you that I would hold you in my thoughts and prayers each day while you were here, and that's the truth. I'm saying that I have, so think back. Think back on the day that what you were doing when you heard, heard about Tyler dying. Think back about the things that you did well. Think back about the things that you didn't do well. The times you fell in love, the times you fell out of love. You got good grades, bad grades, all those things keeping you in my prayers. And you know what I know is that the president has done the same thing? I know that. Because she too is a person of faith. And we've been keeping you in our thoughts and prayers. I want you to know that. And that doesn't, that doesn't uh, end just because you graduate, just because I retire, because we are what we are, baker till we die, we're not. And so you're part of my world. You're part of my world, and I'm going to remember you forever, and I'll be praying for you, and for your well-being, and for your joy, and for your happiness. So one last time, if we're here together today, let's pause in prayer. We thank you, O God, for this graduating class in the spring of 2014. We thank you for their accomplishments, and yes, we thank you for their failures and for their challenges. We thank you for the ways in which they have learned, which they have come together as a class, which they have grown individually. 
We thank you for the ways in which they have achieved the great things, and we thank you for the ways that they have learned. We thank you that they are different people today than when they moved in in the fall of 2010. We thank you that this college experience has been so rich and meaningful to them. We're grateful for parents and for families and for friends who have supported them and guided them along their way. Most especially, we thank you for this day, the day of endings and beginnings. Keep us together while we're apart. Remind us of your great love for us that binds us together all in your family, your human family, the family that calls Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And so we pray now together the prayer that he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
It's going to work out. You wait and see. Well, good morning. Congratulations. Congratulations on being here this morning. I know that this morning came early for some of you. And for some of you, this morning is even still last night. <laughs> Welcome to all of you families, friends. It's good to have you here. Good way to start the day today. I know it's a great day for you. I am proud of these people, and you are proud of these people. Thank you so much for allowing us to work in their educational process and to, and to celebrate with you today. Thank you, faculty, for coming, for making this a part of your graduation day. Thank you for being here. Thank you, President Long, for inviting me to be the speaker. Thank you, Board of Trustees that are here today. Thank you for the hard work that you do on behalf of all of us here at Baker. Well, last summer, Professor Randy Miller secured a federal grant, and he hosted nine biology students from across the country who came handpicked to Baker's campus. They spent two months here researching that wonderful little bug. I asked, I asked Brandon, it's not really a bug, but I don't want to get into that right now. You can ask him later. It's, a, it's this thing that lives on Baker's campus called a tardigrade. And these nine biology students spent two months examining this bug, organism, this thing. And one of the federal guidelines that, that Randy got was this group of students needed to spend some time discussing science and ethics. That was part of the deal to get the federal money. So Professor Miller asked me to come in a couple of times and lead a discussion on science and ethics. Two discussions, one hour each, one month apart. Didn't go well. <laughs> Not at all. Now, Brandon Hefty was in the class, and, and he's from Baker, so he knew me, and he knew that we had a relationship, and that we're friends, and that I meant him no harm, and so he and I had wonderful conversations. But these people from other parts of the country just sort of sat there stone-faced. They seemed disinterested. They would, in fact, prefer to be up in trees or looking through microscopes. They didn't care what I had to say on the subject. They didn't care that there was a minister in the room. In fact, they resented my being there. It looked like they looked bored. They were bored. Faculty colleagues, you've all been there. <laughs> so at the end of my second session, with nothing left to lose, I decided to give the last five minutes of my time with them my quick five-minute lecture on the relationship between science and religion, and how the two aren't in conflict. I mean, you know that, right? Science and religion are not in conflict. I mean, you never read a science book to learn a religion, you never read the Bible to learn science. Simple as that. That's one minute of my five minute speech. <laughs> I guess that's a different sermon. Anyway, when I got done with that, I left the room, glad the experience was over, feeling like a failure, a complete failure on that day. Until, until the next day I got that email. That email from a young woman from another part of the country who said she enjoyed our time together. Who knew? <laughs> and she was intrigued by the way that I was connecting science and religion, and could she come by for a chat? So she did. When she came by, her story was one that I've heard a thousand times if I've heard it once. Her family went to church when she was little. Then something happened, she didn't know what happened. She was eight or nine years old, something happened. The church split, her family left, never to go back. Never to go back to any church, became unchurched people. She remembered liking church when she was a little girl, but all of a sudden then her family was not in church and they just went on their way. She became a scientist, a biologist. She loved science loves biology, she thought it was intriguing that I would talk about science and religion in the same sentence. So she and I had a wonderful hour-long conversation in which I said that not everything can be explained scientifically and not everything can be studied scientifically in the kind of thing that I talk about with people. And when her time was up, I asked if I could pray with her because as you know, if you've been in my office, that's what I do when we get through talking get ready to leave, can we pray? Is that right with you for pray? And sometimes, you know, people are embarrassed by that, don't really feel like they want to, or they feel like they're doing me a favor that I gotta have pray with them, prayer with them, or something like that. Uh, 
So it depends on the person. But this person was a, uh, gave me a great answer, sort of a once in a lifetime answer. So I said, uh, so can I pray with you as, as you leave? And her eyes got really big and wide, sparkly. And she got one of those sound pat long smiles on her face, a really big, nice, great smile. And she says, yeah. <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> President said, I've been working on this sermon a long time. It's been 43 years working on this sermon. sit with an unapologetic neophyte believer who is untainted and not yet cynical about the ways of the world and to have them ask me an honest to God question without embarrassment. What do I do? How do I go about praying? Really? Really, how cool is that? You all want my job. I know you do. <laughs> It reminds me of another instance, sort of my poster child story. I love this guy. I'm not going to tell you who he is. He graduated several years ago, and he's an upstanding, responsible contributor to society, all the things that we like to have people be. He was a football player. This one season, he was in, before the game, the, the, the football team knelt and prayed the Lord's Prayer. And when the prayer was over, the, the kid turned to the football player that was kneeling next to him and said, where can I go to learn that prayer? And so his friend, his football teammate, who was a chapel guy, brought him to me. Hmm, imagine that, a college kid. Now, you know, we're really not in the Bible Belt, I think, because this kid was from Kansas. I mean, this kid was from small town Kansas. And he had, it's not that he had heard about Christianity and rejected it. No, he had never heard the Lord's Prayer. Brought him to me. I know you want my job. What do I do? What do I do? People wonder that about clergy all the time. What is it that we do? In addition to what I'm doing right now, let me tell you what we do. It's true for me. Pastor Antonio and Paul Babcock and Susan Emmel and Ron Holland who's here today and anybody else who's a clergy in this room. Here's what we do. We have been trained to discern God's activity in the world. And once we have discerned it, we have been trained to name it. That's what we do for a living. I know you want my job. I know you want my job. That's what we do. For instance, is it really simply random coincidence for a student from the East Coast who has a stirring in her spirit and in her heart to somehow be selected to go to some place like Kansas for two months and find herself sitting in a room with a minister talking about science and religion and ethics? Is that really just by chance, really? No. Is it just random chance for a football player to kneel next to another football player who happens to know me and ask that question, where do I go to learn that prayer? Really? I have been in the ministry for 43 years for the purpose of discerning God's presence and activity in the world and then naming it. That's what we do for a living. That's how we are. That's how we roll. That's what we do. There's a lot of reasons why I did not enter the ministry. To go to endless committee meetings that seemed pointless. To reconcile budgets, I want to tell you now, right now, and proclaim with great joy that I've been through the ministry for 43 years, and I have not yet, nor will I ever, learn how to use Excel. Can I get an amen for that? <laughs> Because I enjoy getting those phone calls of people complaining.
complaining about the songs we get to sing. No. I've been in the ministry to identify God's actions. And I've been fortunate, fortunate, lucky enough to be able to identify God's actions here at Baker for 22 and a half years. What do I do that's God acting? What do I do? How do I pray? What is that prayer? That is God acting. The fact is, what do I do is a great graduation day question, is it not? Maggie is tired of people asking her what she's going to do. I am too. Because the thing about graduation day is that Monday morning comes early. You know, tomorrow is the, rest, the first day of the rest of your life, right? It comes early. And maybe you're wondering, what are you going to do? And maybe your parents are sitting behind you here wondering, what are you going to do? Maybe if you're in love, your future spouse or at least your partner wants to know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And yet, two things. This is a liberal arts college. And we are a college related to the United Methodist Church. Can I get an amen that we are related to the United Methodist Church? Amen. Say it out loud. Amen. Good job. Thank you. In a, in a school like this, liberal arts, church related, what are you going to do is only the second question that you've got to answer. Because the first one, the one we get to answer, the one that we get to ask, is not what are you going to do, but who are you going to be? Who are you going to be? Who am I going to be? Who are you going to be when I find out on July 1st that I am no longer the minister to Baker University, then who in the heck am I going to be then? More importantly than that, on July the 1st, when for the first time in nearly a hundred years, there is not someone named the Spain who is a member of the clergy, then who the heck am I, really? Class 2014, I think you need to hold each other accountable to answer that question. So I want you right now to turn either way on, on, up and down that road. I want you to ask each other, who are you going to be? Go ahead and do that. Talk amongst yourself. And while they're doing that, the rest of you do it too because it's important to you. Up and down the roads, turn and say, who are you going to be? Who are you going to be? Because you know what? You can be confident and you can be competent, a responsible contributor, etc., 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 etc. But if you don't have values and don't have integrity, to use the words of an old jazz song, it don't mean a thing if you ain't got that swing. It don't mean a thing if you don't have integrity. Always take who you are into the workplace. Now I know who I want to be. I know how I want to be. And I want to invite you to consider these words of how you want to be too. They are my life versus ideals written by Paul. Sometimes I'm able to live up to some of them. Sometimes I'm not able to live up to them so well. But they are my life versus here now, the scripture of the reading for all those traditionalists. Here it comes. The reading of the scripture. It comes to you almost as though you're in a microwave popcorn bag. It's going to pow, 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 pow. So watch out. Here it comes. The Apostle Paul writes to the Roman church in the 12th chapter, verses 1 through 21. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices. Holy and acceptable to God, who is your spiritual worship. 
Do not be conformed to this world. May I say that again? Do not be conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now here comes the popcorn. For by, by the grace given to me, I say to every one among you, do not think more highly than you ought to think of yourself. But love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty. Associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay evil for evil, but take thought of what is noble in the sight of all. If possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And if your enemies are hungry, feed them. And if they are thirsty, give them something to drink. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hmm. Sometimes a guy's got to do what a guy's got to do. Sometimes the guy's got to step out from behind the pole. Because you are my brothers and sisters. And so I'm telling you, I'm pleading with you. Brothers and sisters, present your bodies as living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable to God who is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to this world. Do you realize that there's some people right over there across the aisle from you who have spent all of their lives preparing and a lot of their money preparing to keep you from conforming. They're the ones who have worked at transforming your minds so that you may live a life that is worth, it, worth living. You know all those times when, when the faculty says to you, think outside the box or, or leave your comfort zone, it's transforming your mind taking you from where you used to be to where you're going to be. It is, it is giving you the tools and the energy and the power not to conform, not to conform to the work ways of the world. Do not conform, but be transformed. By what? By the renewing of your mind. I want to thank you. I want to thank you, faculty, because you don't know it all the time, but every day when you get up and you go to work, you go in there and lead a Bible study. And it's Romans 12, 1 and 2. Do not be conformed to this world. Think outside the box. Think different ways. Get out of your comfort zone. Romans 12, 1 and 2. You probably were surprised to know that you're Bible study leaders every day you go into class. And there's a lot of faculty not here this morning. I want you to thank them for me, for being Bible study leaders when they go into class. They're going to be surprised to hear that from you, but go ahead and tell them anyway. Thank you. Thank you from the university minister's bottom of his heart. Thank you all for being Bible study leaders. Every time you role model, thinking out of the box, getting out of your comfort zone. Dr. Sink thought he was just telling only old stories, but it's not that at all. It's thinking out of the box, thinking different ways, new ways. Thank you, thank you, thank you for being Bible study leaders of, of modeling, of embodying that which we hold dear at Baker University. You know, uh, every Wednesday for the last couple of years, I've gone over to our daughter's house and I take my grandkids to school on Wednesday mornings. It's sort of the midweek grandfather fix that I need. So when, when I we go, we're heading for the car, I always say to them, I always quote Dr. Bob Cayley. Now, Bob Cayley was a German professor here for years and years and years. And he died several years ago, and I, I quote what Dr. Cayley said, it was one day at lunch. He, we were all eating together in the cafeteria, and he, it came time for 12th, he had to teach a class. So he pushed himself back from the table, and he was wearing, he was wearing that Calvin and Hobbes sweatshirt, remember this Calvin and Hobbes sweatshirt? For those of you who are visitors today, it wasn't the, it wasn't the cartoon, it was actually John Calvin and John Hobbes. <laughs> this is the university, we're quirky here, it's okay. All of us are quirky. He was quirky, especially quirky. But 
So he, he pushed himself back from the table, got up, and he said, you have to excuse me, friends. It's time for me to go teach because I have to go roll back the frontiers of ignorance. And I tell that to my grandkids every Wednesday morning, and they think I'm nuts. <laughs> they don't get it. They don't understand. They don't understand. In fact, Jack, my seven-year-old grandson, he really doesn't like it. He says, would you just stop saying that? No, I won't, Jack. <laughs> I'm not going to stop saying it. And you know what? I'm not going to stop saying it because one day Jack and Delaney are going to be right where you are or some other place. They're going to be right where you are, caps and gowns. And i got to know, i got to know when my grandkids graduate, there's going to be faculty like you that have, re have stressed their minds, taught them not to conform, taught them to think differently, rolled back the frontier tears of ignorance, and made them people worthy to be college graduates. I need to know that. I need to have that confidence that someplace, sometime, there'll be people who will expand their minds, roll back those frontiers, and help them think outside the box and not conform. All I'm telling you guys, please, 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 brothers and sisters, do not conform. Do not conform to this wisdom. It's going to be seductive. People give you money to conform. People give you fame and, and fortune to, to conform. The people are going to try and put you in a box every step of the way. Please just don't do it. Don't sell out. Don't, don't give in. Please. Please, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present yourself as living sacrifices that are holy and acceptable to God, which is spiritual worship. Do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That God may work in you that which is perfect. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present yourself as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, who is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you too may discern the will of God. May I get an amen from the congregation. Amen. amen.
they give. Use them, O oh God. May they glorify your holy name. May they be used to share with others who are in need, wherever they may be. In the name of Christ, we pray now and always. Amen. transformed this world, but to do what God made you to do, what God calls you to do, what God leads you to do. Go to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. The blessings of God Almighty, Creator, Redeemer, ever and always present Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always and forever. Amen. <laughs>